it's quickly becoming apparent that traditional forms of project procurement will not be appropriate to develop hydrogen projects. Now, in South Africa and many other jurisdictions around the world, the single-point EPC contracting model is the preferred procurement approach for major project delivery in the private sector. Now, I know this is a controversial position, but the reason why I suggest that the EPC model is not appropriate for the development of hydrogen projects are briefly as follows. Firstly, this model generally shifts the majority of the project risk to the contractor, which, when the contractor is not always the best party to manage that risk. Now, this is particularly so when looking at delivering a hydrogen project where there are multiple technologies, such as the wind component, solar component, often battery component as well, and civil construction, which all needs to be interfaced for the plant to run efficiently. Now, secondly, as a result of the inequitable risk allocation, which usually flows with EPC contracting, in order to maintain their rights and potentially seek the recovery of unanticipated costs, parties are forced to adopt an adversarial stance early on in the project to protect their interests, and they are not incentivized to collaborate and adopt a solutions-driven approach to deliver the project. Rather, they're incentivized to protect their own position by issuing notices, and as a result, a significant amount of time, effort, and cost is spent on administering the contract rather than focusing on finding solutions and workshopping project challenges. Now, the third point I want to touch on is that EPC contracting risk profiles tend to result in a significant amount of contingency being built into the contract price to account for the unexpected cost overruns. Now, as I've touched on, delivering a hydrogen project requires the interfacing of multiple packages of work, and inevitably, subcontractors will build in contingency into their subcontract price, and that EPC contractor will then build in further contingency into its contract price, which is essentially contingency on contingency to wrap the risk of the entire project, which can dramatically increase the overall project delivery cost. So this is where EPC procurement model is at a material disadvantage. Now, in the interest of time, I won't go through chapter and verse um, some of the other challenges with EPC contracting, but it is worth noting that one of the reasons why I have taken this view is because in Australia, we recently advised a developer on a green hydrogen project, whereby we were instructed to prepare a traditional EPC contract to deliver the entire project, which consisted of a wind farm, a solar farm, battery storage, grid connection, and a gas network connection. Now, after discussing this approach with a potential hot, uh, head contractor, the parties quickly realized that this form of procurement was just not feasible in the circumstances with the multiple interface risks and the astronomical contract price, which was required to wrap the risk of the project. In short, there was simply too much risk in the EPC contract for a single contractor to manage within an acceptable contract price. Now, on the flip side, a number of proponents advocate that the alliance-style contracts are the preferred procurement approach, whereby parties work collaboratively together to achieve project objectives. Now, while this approach is theoretically a best-for-project procurement approach and has worked in a number of instances in the public sector in some jurisdictions, my personal view is that this is not practical for delivering projects in the private sector for the following reasons. Firstly, banks are less willing to provide financing against such a risk profile. The, what I would argue is artificially, or the artificial price certainty that is offered by EPC contracting is not necessarily present in an alliance contract. And the financial modeling required to, it requires more flex to account for the potential variance in CapEx, which can also be a detriment to private equity investment. Secondly, the fluidity of alliance contracts is arguably not workable in the private sector given the delay in del delivering commercial assets can materially impact upon profitability and cash flow forecasts that will have knock-on effects on financing. Thirdly, there's a risk of material cost overruns with this type of procurement approach, given there are fewer time bars and more flexibility in costs which are recoverable. So consequently, this procurement approach is also not without its challenges. So if the traditional procurement approaches are not economic, efficient, or adequate to deliver hydrogen projects, alternative procurement models need to be considered to ensure that hydrogen projects are delivered in an economic and efficient manner. 
So where to from here? Next slide, please. One way of bridging this gap between the two extremes of EPC contracting and alliance contracting is to utilize a hybrid EPC contract, which incorporates project management and collaboration mechanisms, which you would normally expect to see in an alliancing style contract, while maintaining some of the accountability that is found in an EPC contract. Now, some of the features of this type of a contract would include incentivized pricing with pain gain share mechanisms, you would see performance targets to keep contractors honest and to allow a developer to assess the way in which a contractor is executing the works. We would incorporate steering committee leadership risk management teams and workshops to deal with unexpected delays and additional costs as and when they arise and to workshop a solution that's acceptable to all parties rather than save this up to the end to be resolved in lengthy and costly dispute resolution proceedings. You'd also see a revised notices of regime whereby early warning notices are required to be issued with certain time bars applying for non-compliance, which will encourage all parties to properly administer the contract, but which is less burdensome than the notices regime, which is often unrealistic in traditional EPC contracts. And finally, you'd look at including a rapid dispute resolution process so that issues are resolved quickly and commercially to avoid substantial costs being incurred by all parties on protracted and complex legal disputes. Now, we've prepared such a bespoke solution in the past to meet the specific needs of a project, taking into account the key pressure points where there are material interface risks and which could result in significant cost blowouts. However, such a hybrid EPC contracting model will need to be developed on a case-by-case -case basis to ensure it is fit for purpose. Trying to fit a square peg into a round hole can have disastrous results. So the other type of procurement which is starting to emerge on the hydrogen projects in Australia is a split contracting approach where the project is divided up into packages and awarded to specialist contractors. By adopting this approach, risk is being allocated to the party that is best able to manage it. And this in turn results in significant contingencies being cut out of the project price for each package. Now the way in which this type of contracting model can be delivered will vary depending on the strength and capability of the developer's delivery team. Given the new technologies involved on hydrogen projects and the desire to minimize risk given the various unknowns on these developments, we are seeing the interface management risk being shifted to EPCMs or engineer procurement and construction management contracts rather than managing this risk in-house. This is not a new approach to delivering contracts, but it is arguably not as prevalent in the market as EPC contracting. This approach allows developers to be more involved in the design and engineering process than they usually would be involved under an EPC contract. And it gives them the ability to be more agile with project delivery to a certain extent. Now, the alternative to this approach is to employ a team that sits within Project Co to work together to manage and deliver the project. However, a significant amount of risk will remain within the project company if this approach is taken. The in-house project delivery team must be sufficiently experienced and qualified if this approach is to be implemented. Now, we've seen split contracting approaches being utilized in the renewable energy market in some jurisdictions, and it has been an effective way to deliver a project more economically. One project which I worked on that adopted the split contracting model was the development of multiple wind farm projects in Thailand where contract packages were awarded to turbine manufacturers, civil contractors, electrical contractors, etc., to deliver the project and the project company retained the interface risk and managed the project delivery. The project was ultimately well executed and was completed on time and on budget. So that was a real win in that instance. Now, the other approach I would like to quickly touch on that we are also seeing in Australia on a few hydrogen projects is the ECI model or early contractor involvement model. This is becoming increasingly popular on projects where there is a substantial risk and a number of unknowns at the outset, and the parties need to work together early on to set the battery limits and engineer solutions to effectively deliver projects. Now, this procurement model requires the developer and the head contractor to work together during the feed stage to workshop solutions to cost effectively and efficiently deliver a project. It also potentially allows the contractor to commence certain works prior to the feed being completed, which allows the, the project to be completed in a slightly more expedited manner as well. 
One of the advantages of this approach is that having contractors involved at the outset of a project allows them to clearly understand the risks and pitfalls with delivery, as well as the key pressure points for the project, which in turn enables them to more effectively price and program the project. Now, one of the drawbacks with this approach, however, is that the early commitment to a contractor, which eliminates, your, sorry, let me take that back. One of the drawbacks is that you're required to commit earlier to a contractor, which eliminates the competitive tender process. Now, a counter to this view is, is to potentially pay the contractor an abort fee with an option to re-tender the work once fee has been completed and make the award subject to a competitive tender process. But again, the risk with a competitive tender process is that a contractor underbids the work or underestimates the work involved and the adversarial cycle starts again with the contractor seeking to recover additional payments for unanticipated costs. So the moral of the story here is that cheaper is not always better. So these few alternative procurement approaches really demonstrate how important it is that we approach the delivery of hydrogen projects looking at an innovative and bespoke models of procurement, which may well push us outside of our comfort zones. But the key to alternative procurement approaches being successfully implemented is to ensure that a procurement approach which matches the risk profile of each individual project is considered on a case-by-case -case basis. We need to be flexible with our approach and utilize innovative approaches to drive efficiency and deliver better projects.